Hey, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Jackie. And thanks uh, to Jackie and Megan, who are helping to administer this from behind the scenes. And thanks to all of you for being with us here today. So it's a, a great pleasure to be here with you. I hope you're healthy and well. And today's one of my favorite topics. It's our conservation work. We have a really talented conservation team at the BTC, and I'm just thrilled that they're going to share their world with us today. So um, as per usual, I have the great pleasure of introducing our talented panelists. And again, I'm, I'm very lucky to work with these folks uh, every single day. So first we have Adam Brylowski. He's our manager of conservation and trail, and he's been with the BTC for over 10 years. Adam has a background in urban forestry and ecological restoration, a Bachelor of Environmental Studies from York University, and a post-grad certificate in ecosystem restoration from Niagara College. Prior to working for the BTC, Adam worked for the forestry department at the City of Toronto as a natural resource management technician as well as an organization called Urban Forest Associates that work to restore degraded natural spaces in Toronto. So welcome, Adam, and thank you. Next up, we have Brian Papalier, and Brian is our talented land stewardship coordinator where he utilizes his years of experience to perform ecological inventories on over 13,000 acres of BTC managed land, as well as preparing management plans for BTC properties. Brian holds a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science and Biology from Trent University, as well as certificates in ecological land classification, bird and plant identification, butternut assessment, Ontario pesticide forestry license, and Ontario wetland evaluation. Brian can often be found in the forests and watersheds of Ontario, hiking, fishing, taking pictures, camping, or just enjoying the beauty of nature. So welcome, Brian. And lastly, we have the newest member of our team who's uh, Mara McAfee, and Mara has been working as an ecologist at the BTC since September, and her primary role is in managing the BTC's new landowner stewardship program. So Mara is a certified arborist and holds a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology and Conservation from the University of Guelph and a Master of Science in Biology from McMaster University. Prior to joining the BTC, Mara held roles in both the academic and nonprofit spheres, Mara conducted ecological research in a variety of ecosystems from grasslands in southern Ontario to the boreal forests in the Northwest Territories. In the nonprofit field, Mara carried out environmental education and community stewardship projects for local organizations, including the Royal Botanical Gardens and the Hamilton Naturalist Club. So congratulations and thank you and welcome to you, Mara. So con conservation team, I turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Adam Berlowski, and I'm going to be uh, starting this presentation. And just to give a little bit of context, um, we wanted to uh, share with you the, the stuff that we do in the conservation sphere. So obviously, the Bruce Trail is a trail organization, but our mandate is to create a, a wildlife corridor, a conservation corridor along the Niagara Escarpment. So this presentation is get into the, gonna get into the work that we do and um, hopefully uh, give you a little bit uh, more of an understanding of, of the conservation work that we do at the Bruce Trail Conservancy. So here we are, this is our, our mission and our vision and values. <clears throat> uh, as, as I mentioned with our conservation corridor, uh, we really wanted to capture that in our mission. So uh, our mission is preserving a ribbon of wilderness for everyone forever. So the conservation corridor we're creating is that ribbon of wilderness and uh, we're committed to completing it. Right now we, we're about 68% complete with uh, acquisitions and uh, the trail going through protected lands already. So uh, your donations really help us. So to give an overview of the land stewardship program, <clears throat> it started back in the 1970s when uh, the Bruce Trail Conservancy started acquiring land and the very first property that we acquired, uh, you can see to your right on the map, and it's called the Ken Young property, just around the corner from Old Baldy. So that was acquired in 1976. And then by the time we got to 1996, we had a good chunk of land under our belt, about 4,500 acres. And at that time, <clears throat> the Bruce Trail Conservancy was actually called the Bruce Trail Association. And we decided that it was probably safer for us to transfer all of that land over to uh, an agency of the province of Ontario. Uh, we were concerned a little bit about liability <clears throat> and also taxes. 
So having them held by the, a public agency would absolve us from that. <clears throat> and uh, that's exactly what we did. So in 1997, we transferred approximately 4,500 acres to the Ontario Heritage Trust, which is a, a, a branch of the provincial government that looks after um, culturally or naturally significant uh, places in, in Ontario. So we worked very closely with them to manage the 4,500 acres that uh, we transferred over to them back in the late, late 90s. And uh, moving on up until uh, 2019, actually at 2020 now, we're at about 320 parcels, just over 12,000 acres of land that we manage along the, uh, the Niagara Escarpment. And to give you a bit of a breakdown, <clears throat> the, uh, the BTC, we own 6,200 acres and, and change, the OHT, the Ontario Heritage Trust, again, 4,500 acres. And there's a couple other organizations that, that, that I won't get into there that we partner with. <clears throat> but I would like to draw your attention to the map on the right of the screen. And if you guys are familiar with the Bruce Trail Conservancy, you, you already know this, but just, uh, just to be safe, I'll mention that uh, the Bruce Trail, the way that we, it's, it's organized is it's cut up into nine different clubs, all the way from Niagara at the bottom to the peninsula up at the top. And the way these clubs works, work is that they're all autonomous. They have their own board of directors, their own volunteers, and they uh, take care of all of the trail and, and land that we manage within their club section. So each club has a director of land stewardship, a volunteer director of land stewardship, and uh, we work with them, myself and the conservation team work with them in order to manage the properties that we, we have under our belt. So for the program to work, <clears throat> we have uh, the two ecologists, actually it's three ecologists now that Mar is on board. And uh, we have one volunteer stewardship committee chair and then the nine club directors that I mentioned earlier. And in terms of land stewards, people that we, volunteers we have actually on the ground uh, actively looking at our properties and uh, monitoring them and managing them. We have about 250 of these land stewards. And what do they do? So land stewards, uh, essentially they're brought into their club and into the program by their land stewardship director who um, you know, lives in the particular community that, uh, that their club is in and reaches out to people that are, have an interest in doing this kind of work. And what we ask of them is to visit their property at least twice annually and provide a written annual report to their stewardship director. We call these annual monitoring reports. <clears throat> and um, these are important for us because they keep their observations about encroachment, trespassing, hunting, any other kind of misuse that could be happening on the property. And um, let, they let us know about it. So it's incredibly important for us to uh, follow up on these for conservation, but also for liability, because if there's someone that's um, riding a dirt bike on our property and we turn a blind eye, that's actually a huge risk to us as an organization. Uh, land stewards also implement recommendations in land stewardship plans, and I'm going to get into land stewardship plans a little bit later, actually Brian will. And uh, what they are is basically a report that uh, BTC staff writes uh, about the management <clears throat> of each particular property and land stewards read through these reports and uh, their management is based on, on those in, in part. They also make new recommendations for the management of properties based on their intimate knowledge uh, on the ground of the proper, property and they bring uh, problems to their land stewardship director. On the right, you'll see a, uh, a picture of a couple of our, lands, our past land stewardship directors installing a prothonotary warbler nest box at a, uh, a wetland in Speyside on one of our properties. So far, there's no prothonotaries uh, using it, but we're ever hopeful. I mentioned land stewardship directors. So these are the volunteers that uh, coordinate the stewardship efforts for each club. And what they're essentially responsible for, as I said, is re recruiting and training volunteers. They also sit on a, the stewardship committee, which we meet twice a year and discuss issues and problems and solutions that, that we can find together. Uh, they also assist land stewards with the implementation of their recommendations from each stewardship plan. And they keep their club executives uh, and the land stewardship committee advised of what kind of acti activities are happening <clears throat> within their club. And finally, they collect the annual reports from the land stewards that uh, are out on the ground, boots on the ground. 
And there's two of the land stewardship staff, that's Brian and myself, when we were seeding a, uh, a large agricultural land uh, on one of our properties with a uh, tall grass prairie mix, which we're really proud of. So what do we do? <clears throat> I'll get in, I'll go over it really quickly. We do the land stewardship plans. Uh, after 10 years, we update every land stewardship plan. So we have a number of new properties every year, let's say on average seven properties every year are, are newly acquired by the Bruce Trail Conservancy. <clears throat> and then we also update 10 of those old plans in order to bring them up with current conservation standards. So we assist stewardship directors in solving issues and providing advice, <clears throat> especially with the special projects that might require permits, permits from the Niagara Escarpment Commission or, or uh, local conservation authorities. So as staff, we sort of help to um, bridge that gap between government and volunteers, although a lot of our volunteers are very well versed in dealing with municipalities and governments because they are the ones that are on the ground doing this stuff. Uh, we produce and monitor land use agreements. So one thing that's interesting about our approach to land management is that if there is active agriculture on a property when we acquire it, we chat with the farmer and ask if they'd be interested in continuing on because we're not in the business of removing prime agriculture from our properties. We wanna keep it uh, in, in production. <clears throat> and partly this is also because hay fields are important nesting habitats for certain grass nesting birds. And we can talk about that again later. <clears throat> but we do have uh, uh, in and around 20 land use agreements for various things, pulling of hay, some of them are row crops, but we try to keep good community relations with local farmers. Uh, we have twice a year, we have land steward training workshops and anyone is welcome to come. Any of you people are welcome to come. Uh, come learn what we do and, and get your hands a little dirty. We usually go for a, a hike in the afternoons. And we work closely with the land stewardship committee chair. <clears throat> right now that's John Farkason. And he, uh, he is sort of uh, the, the, the head of the committee that helps us brainstorm and come to uh, solutions to problems we're faced with. As I mentioned, we liaise with the Ontario Heritage Trust and we, we also audit 10 properties per year that they own. And that's just a way of us both being on the same page when it comes to property management. We do community outreach and education and uh, we also sit on the land stewardship committee, as you can imagine. So after acquisition, what happens? I'm gonna pass this on to Brian Popelier, my colleague, and uh, he'll get you uh, up to speed on exactly what we do after a property is acquired. Over to you, Brian. So, uh, to help monitor the property for us, um, we do some staff site visits to do our biophysical inventory and those those visits go into preparing our land stewardship plans um, and we look at any um, projects or recommendations from that land stewardship plan to implement and then after 10 years like adam mentioned we uh, we do a, a review so what, what do our staff visits involve so we do a three season biophysical inventory so we do uh, a spring visit summer visit and a fall visit we do this because certain plants um, pop up in the spring. Um, a good example would be trilliums or uh, spring beauties. <clears throat> so they pop up in the spring, but by fall, they're um, they're done flowering and their their leaves have started to um, deteriorate. So they're not even around in the fall. So that's why we have to do certain visits at certain times of the year. So with biophysical features, we look at you know the, what plants are on the properties. We look at all the animals birds etc look at the geology of the property the soils and the hydrology species at risk are, are always uh, an important factor for us and we're always on the lookout for any rare species um, we look at what ecological communities are on the property what invasive species are on the property we look at the cultural features such as are, are there any structures uh, is there agriculture happening fencing anything like that uh, we, we catalog and lastly we look at any encroachment or trespassing issues on the property so all, all this stuff is incorporated into our property um, stewardship plans so we're going to go through each each one that i just mentioned and to kind of talk it about talk about it 
So the biophysical inventory, like I said, we're, we're looking at everything ecologically that's on that property. Uh, so we're looking at all the vegetation and, uh, and our faunal species. So of course we do our vegetation surveys. So we, we try to identify every plant that we, we find on that property. And that all goes into a database that we have. Um, we look at, we do bird surveys, uh, which basically allows us to, to monitor the breeding birds that are using our properties. And like I said, we, use, uh, we look at other faunal observations. We don't do any um, official surveys for any of these other faunal species. Um, they're more of, as we're walking around the properties and we catalog just what we see. So ecological community. So we basically, we, we, we base our monitoring on, it's, it's called the ecological land classification system. So this is a standardized system to classify natural areas based on the ecological factors that are present. So such as soils, um, bedrock, climate, and vegetation. So by classifying the land, it aids us in managing and monitoring our lands for conservation while also allowing us allowing sustainable public access to these properties through our footpath. So knowing the, the, the ecological community type is very important to help understand um, what's on our properties and if there's anything rare. And that all goes into the, the, the stewardship plans. Mapping. So I'm sure you all know the BTC, we love our mapping. Um, and our conservation work is no different. So maps are great, great because they provide a visual to actually what's on the land. So all of our stewardship plans include several maps and there's a kind of a list of, we look at the local and just a regional context map where the property is in relation to um, its, its surroundings. We do uh, soils and, and drainage mapping. Um, our biotic conditions map, which basically is our ELC mapping. Cultural conditions, like I said, we do a map of anything we see that's on that property. We take GPS points and um, transfer that to a map. So you, when you see that cultural conditions map, you, you see everything that's on that property with regards to fencing, um, boardwalks, any type of structure, um, et cetera, et cetera. So special land use designations. So that if a property falls within an um, area of natural or scientific interest, which is an MNRF designation, um, provincially significant wetlands, um, anything like that, it yeah, goes in our special land use um, designation map. Um, of course, the Niagara Escarpment Plan, we have a specific map that, that shows um, you know, what designation our properties fall under, under the, the, the Escarpment Plan. And we do a sensitive features map as well. So any species at risk um, that we find on the properties, that, that's mapped as well, as long with any critical habitat that, that is also on the properties. So yeah, there's just uh, some examples there of our, the maps. Um, Adam was talking about land use agreements. So, so like he said, it, you know, we, we do have several land use agreements on our properties. Um, most of them are agricultural. Um, like we have certain restrictions that we put into our land use agreements. For instance, most of our property is in hay, um, but we have certain restrictions such as we, we delay the haying period to, to protect our grassland birds, um, you know, so, so they're not, not, not injured and then the fledglings have time to, to leave the nest. Um, I think Adam pretty much covered uh, a lot of what uh, our land use agreements deal with. Uh, right, right now we have about 500 acres in, in agricultural land. So species at risk. Um, so basically a species at risk is a sensitive species that is defined as rare in, in a certain area. So we have, there's the Committee on the Status of Wildlife in Canada, which is a national body. And then we have the Committee on the Status of Species at Risk in Ontario, which is our provincial body. So they basically um, categorize species in these three categories. So we have special concern. So that means the species has characteristics that make it sensitive to human activities or natural events. 
You have a threatened species, means a species that is at risk of becoming endangered, um, basically if something's not done now to protect that, that species. And endangered is a species that's facing imminent extinction or extirpation. So obviously, species at risk is very important to us at uh, the Bruce Trail Conservancy. So currently, um, we have 1,537 records of 84 different species of conservation concern or species at risk on our managed land. So what that means is so we have 84 different species that have, we have multiple records on that we have catalog, uh, cataloged. So for instance, uh, butternut tree, it's an endangered species. So that's one species, but we have probably 300 records uh, of butternuts that we've observed on our properties. And, and so that, that's all categ categorized and, and mapped. Um, we have a huge database of species at risk, so we know exactly where all these important species are. So this, this list is constantly growing as uh, you know, we discover new species with each property visit. Pretty much every time we go to a property, um, we either find a butternut tree, uh, eastern wood peewee, or a wood thrush. They, they just, they love the forested um, habitat that we, we protect along the escarpment. So there's just a kind of a short list of our most abundant. So you got the butternut, American hearts tongue fern, just loves the, the Niagara escarpment. Uh, we, we have hundreds of, um, observations of, of hard tongue fern all along the, the trail in our properties. Um, you got the bobolink and the eastern meadowlark. Those are um, grassland birds that we protect. And like Adam mentioned, um, some of our hay fields um, do a great job of uh, protecting habitat for those, those birds. Uh, and then the monarch butterfly. Um, we have lots, lots of milkweed on our properties and the monarchs just love it. So once we kind of categorize and look at um, what ecosites are on the property, species, then we kind of look at, okay, what's, what's affecting this property that, that could damage the habitat or, or our, our, um, our properties? So that's any kind of encroachment or misuse. Uh, we take it very serious and we try to stop that activity um, as quickly as possible. So you know, some examples, ATVs, motorized vehicle usage, um, bicycles, uh, dumping of yard waste, uh, encroachment from neighboring properties. We have had properties where um, someone built a shed <laughs> and they didn't realize the property line. So half their sheds on our property. So that's something that we would have to deal with. Uh, any damage to, to vegetation, including unauthorized uh, tree removal for, for, uh, for wood we've had many instances of that. Hunting, we do not allow hunting on any of our properties, so um, we have to manage that if we find that use. A lot of times, historically, when we acquire a property, these uses have been happening, and once we acquire it, um, all, all we allow is um, hiking and snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, um, so we have to do a lot of work to stop this um, activity from the past, which includes signage, includes fencing. Uh, we build barriers. We work with the local municipality. We work with the local um, police force to try to um, stop any of this encroachment or misuse. Invasive species. So there's lots of, lots of uh, species that we, we want to have on our properties. They're native to Ontario. But there's also lots of invasive species that have come from other areas of the world, and they they are a detriment to the biodiversity of, of, of Ontario. So we try to we do a lot of work to to get rid of these invasive species on our property. So there's certain target species that we're always looking for, and these species have been here, you know, since European settlers have come but they basically take over the natural environment and prevent our native species from growing. So even though they've been here for a while, um, we still need to do a lot of work to, to get rid of them, to bring our um, native bio, biodiversity back. So there's, a, there's just a list of a couple. So garlic, garlic mustard, common buckthorn, dog strangling vine, giant hogweed, the Japanese knotweed, and wild chervil. 
So like I said, we do a lot of work. We, uh, um, we work with our volunteers to have polling parties. We, uh, um, we've removed thousands and thousands of um, populations of invasive species on our properties. Um, this is just another tool in our battle against invasives. So it's a, a boot brush station. So we, we began these installations in the summer of 2018, and we have uh, 30 stations along the Bruce Trail in the peninsula section. Um, so recently, in 2020, um, once we were able to kind of get back out there, we were starting to put these down in some of the southern sections. Um, I actually have one sitting in my shed, ready to go for our McNally property in the Iroquois section. Um, so other than, you know, invasive species removal and our monitoring on our property with uh, plants and animals, uh, we do a lot of conservation work with regards uh, to tree and shrub plantings. Um, so this is all recommended in our stewardship plan that we see opportunities to increase forest cover, um, maybe fill in some, some areas to connect to forested areas. That's where we, we start to do some tree and shrub planting. Um, probably about eight years ago, we started to do more just native wildflower and grass plantings. So that, that's also important habitat that we need to, um, you know, need to foster. Um, it's not all about just planting trees. Uh, our wildflowers and grasses are great pollinator species that, that really need to, um, you know, to be built up. And we have certain areas that it's, it's the perfect place to to plant wildflowers or grasses instead of just planting some trees and shrubs. Uh, we do a lot of artificial habitat restoration. Uh, we have a whole bird box program all along the, uh, the trail on our properties. So we have our volunteers that monitor these boxes. Um, they clean them out. They um, write down what, what they see in these boxes. And uh, so we have a whole, whole database of uh, our bird boxes and what's, what's using them. Uh, bee boxes are another little thing that a lot of people don't think about, but I think they're, they're getting more and more popular. Um, so if you look to the right, there's that diamond-shaped little house there with the tubes. So that's what a bee box looks like. So it basically provides habitat for our many, many native bees that a lot of people don't realize. They don't really nest in um, like hives or colonies. They actually are just singular and they, they, they nest in um, like stems of like goldenrod and asters and by providing these bee boxes it just allows you know a little bit more um, habitat. So about five or six years ago we started to have a lot of uh, corporate volunteer events so uh, a lot of businesses were becoming interested in, in our work and they saw the value in it so we you know started to have a lot of work parties where uh, corporate um, staff would come out to our properties and help us out. Um, most of it would involve invasive species removal. We'd get 10 to 20 people and we'd just make a day of it, have a lunch. And it was a great time to just um, teach some of our, our, the corporate employees what the Bruce Trail Conservancy was all about. Um, they, they're very, very popular. We've also built uh, bird and bee houses with them. Um, we, we usually do an interpretive hike and then uh, then get to work uh, removing uh, invasive species or um, planting some trees or building like a bird or a bee house. So at uh, our first corporate event was actually in 2004, 2008. We began to actually ask for donations for these events. Um, and then 2017, it just started to, to explode and uh, we've had a, a lot of interest in this this feature. So I'm going to throw it over to um, Mara, our landowner stewardship coordinator, to talk about her program. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, so our landowner stewardship program is basically all about helping private landowners along the Bruce Trail to steward their land in a way that promotes and enhances biodiversity. And if you remember back uh, at the beginning of this talk, Adam mentioned that about 67% of the Bruce Trail Corridor is permanently protected, um, but this program actually focuses on the other 30 some percent of land that's actually still held by private landowners. 
Um, and this program was initiated because we realized that while we can do really great conservation work uh, on the lands that we manage um, or other, <coughs> sorry, um, we can do great conservation work on the lands that we manage. Um, those are isolated lands right now. And to really create a true corridor, we need to connect those lands together. And so I threw this uh, map up just to show you um, the red is the Bruce Trail. And you can see that in the pink are lands that the Bruce Trail is own, uh, owns and manages. The green is public conservation land, but in the middle, those yellow lands are all private lands. And you can see to really connect the corridor together, we need to also be thinking about those private lands. And so with that in mind, over the last year, we've been rolling out this new a program for, and it's for any private landowner that has the Bruce Trail optimum route going across their property. So they have the Bruce Trail already on their property, or maybe they've been approached by volunteers about getting that, uh, getting the trail on their property in the future. And so it's a uh, free program to participate. And basically the way it works is that we, uh, we really wanna tailor the program to the needs of each individual person and each property. And so we start by doing a site visit on the property with the landowner. We usually take a walk around and kind of talk about uh, what their goals might be, what kinds of stewardship projects they might be interested in. And we can kind of take a look and see if there's any issues like are there invasive species on the property, uh, that kind of thing. And then after the site visit, um, uh, the BTC staff usually creates a sort of a brief, easy to follow stewardship plan that basically just uh, details what kinds of goals we talked about during the site visit and then recommends some different actions that can be taken uh, to work towards those goals. And then in addition, we provide landowners with some information and resources about some of the topics that we talked about. For example, if they want to learn how to identify uh, invasive species on their property, we'll, we'll send them some information about that. And then we kind of provide support long term and the support can vary um, from person to person depending on what they need. But um, in some cases, we might have volunteers that are uh, available in the area and they'll actually come out and help the landowner remove invasive species, for example. Um, and so it's really meant to be tailored to uh, each individual property and landowner. And it's uh, just a way that landowners can voluntarily uh, learn more about biodiversity on their property and how they can protect it. Um, and can I get the next slide? Perfect. So uh, as I mentioned, this was the very first year of the program. And despite it being a very crazy year, um, we were able to have some, some early successes with the program. And so uh, this photo shown here was actually taken by one of our land stewardship directors, Gary Hall. Um, and this is an example where we were able to um, have some volunteers come out and help remove invasive species. And so overall this year, we engaged 13 different landowners across four of our Bruce Trail Club sections. We did lots of invasive species removal in a few different properties. And we also worked with some landowners to plant um, native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers along the trail corridor to enhance biodiversity along our ribbon of wilderness. And what was really great to see this year is we actually had neighbors working together to uh, create a bigger impact. And so what started with one person interested in removing some buckthorn on her property turned into five neighbors working together to not only remove invasive species, but then also plant some native trees. And we had another group of um, neighbors working together and they're actually working together to apply for a grant to uh, increase their impact. So it's been a really great uh, first year of the program and we're really looking forward to um, what we can do in the future. Can you get the next slide? So next year, um, our goal is to um, start talking to, to new landowners who might be interested in this program, but it's also about supporting landowners long-term. And so anybody who's participated in the program this year will be following up with them and just seeing if they uh, need any help or extra assistance and just seeing how things are going uh, with them. And we're hoping to kind of uh, spread the program along the trail so that we can talk to landowners and work with landowners across all of our club sections uh, in the future. So with that in mind, um, I encourage you to uh, learn more about the program. If you are a landowner along the trail or you know someone who is, um, please feel free to spread the word and get in touch with us about this program. Um, we're, there'll be some information coming to our website pretty soon about the program, um, but for now I've just provided my email address and feel free to reach out to us or reach out to our head office and then we'll uh, get in touch. And I'll pass it back to Adam. Okay, thanks so much, Mara. <clears throat> um, 
I just like to reiterate how important this landowner stewardship program is for us. When we're talking about a ribbon of wilderness, um, we can't just steward the land that only is owned by the Bruce Trail. Um, we're really concerned about also protecting the rest of the Niagara Scarpment Corridor. So um, this program is, is really working to, to sort of increase conservation along the Niagara Scarpment. And it's also working to, to bring the trail together with conservation, which is sort of what we're all about. So to close off this presentation, I just wanted to mention a couple special projects that we've been working on and that are in the works for uh, the next year. Um, we are working on a birding platform at our Otter Lake property up on the Bruce Peninsula, which is a, uh, a huge shallow inland lake that has an extensive marsh around the outside and um, a fantastic, fantastic presence of birds there. Um, so we, uh, we recognize the fact that this would probably be very important to naturalists and we're going to be installing a birding platform uh, on the Otter Lake property, which I suggest everyone go and uh, visit uh, in the spring um, when the birds are back. We also are taking safety measures on some of our properties. Most recently, uh, we've been looking at trying to increase safety at the Devil's Monument, which is also up on the Bruce Peninsula. And for those of you who haven't been there, it's a large flower pot stack. So it's sort of a, it's, it's, um, it's like vase shaped and that it's a stack of rocks that's skinnier at the bottom and larger on top. Looks like a big hammer almost. And we are working to try, uh, well, we have uh, rerouted the trail on the property in order to keep people away from it in case it might fall over because this is the Niagara Escarpment and rocks do fall on people. Not necessarily on people, but they do fall. Uh, we just acquired a massive 530 acre property up on the Bruce Peninsula at Cape Chin. And uh, that property was, used for grazing of cattle, which is fine, but unfortunately the cattle have um, gotten into the woodlots and the wetlands and basically eaten all of the understory. So we're going to be working on restoring that area. There's also a huge house that comes on that property. So um, we're in the process of determining what we can best do with that house, whether or not we can fix it up or uh, and use it as some sort of educational center or if we just remove it and, and uh, restore the, the land back to its natural state. Either way, 530 acres of conservation land protected. It's a pretty big deal for us. I mentioned the prairie restoration that we did on our Fisher's Pond property in Waterdown. So uh, we, we did a, uh, uh, we hand seeded 11 acres in tall grass prairie mix. And uh, that's coming along right now. That's gonna really help with uh, native pollinators and also grassland nesting birds like bobolink and uh, the meadowlark. All the time, not all the time, certain times we get properties with houses like the fox property. We, uh, we acquired one of these such properties about eight years ago and the house was in such terrible shape that it needed to be demolished. Um, it was very interesting though because it was a historical house and we had the Gray County Museum come in and um, assess and take anything that they thought might be historically valuable. And that's all sitting, that stuff's all sitting in the Gray County Museum now. Parking lots are something that we're always working on. It may sound counterintuitive, counterintuitive for conservation, but safety is also very important for us. So we want to provide uh, our trail users with a safe place to park as opposed to just having to park on the side of the road sometimes. So parking lots are something that we always, uh, we always think of when we acquire a new property uh, in terms of trail access, because we want people to be safe. Uh, the, the, myself and Brian, since we're the uh, two trained ecologists, we are also in the business of approving trail routes. So whenever we acquire a new property, we have to ensure that the, the route of the trail doesn't impact any sensitive species or sensitive communities. And this has happened in the past. So we'll sort of walk the route and ensure that um, it's, it's in the proper place. And if necessary, we'll change its direction slightly to uh, protect whatever it is that we deem valuable. Uh, we do long-term breeding bird surveys on some of our properties. Otter Lake is one of those properties. So we're eagerly anticipating this, uh, the, the, the birding platform as well. And then fencing and barrier installation. This is something that we deal with all along the entire escarpment. And, and that's because people love driving ATVs and dirt bikes and Jeeps and any other kind of vehicle 
uh, off trail and land that we own usually doesn't have structures on it. So it's not something that people um, think is actively used. So we install barriers. And so far this has been working relatively well for us. Although there's always that 5% that just doesn't really heed any warnings or um, land uses. In terms of partnerships, uh, we partner with a number of different like-minded organizations. The Nature Conservancy of Canada, uh, we've been working with them to do invasive species removal of Phragmites or common reed up on the Bruce Peninsula. Uh, the Bruce Trail goes through seven different conservation authorities and we work with all of them. Uh, four of the main uh, ones that we are in more frequent contact with are Credit Valley Conservation, the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, Gray Sable Conservation and Conservation Halton. And I understand that we have a question about conservation authorities uh, that we're going to get to just after this. Ontario Nature is another organization that we work with. We co-manage about a thousand acres worth of land up on the Bruce Peninsula with them, our Malcolm Bluff Shores Nature Reserve. It's a fantastic place to go and visit. The Ontario Land Trust Alliance is a great organization that uh, helps us with all kinds of grants and um, uh, also but ecological conservation minded projects like bat monitoring, and uh, bird monitoring. We've also partnered with Ducks Unlimited and McMaster University, uh, their geology department. Uh, they took an interest in, um, in the Niagara Scarpment and working with us to promote geo stories, uh, which are sort of uh, slide shots of different areas on the, the escarpment and some geological information to accompany them. And this is still in the works. So that's the end of the presentation. And um, I'm going to take questions now. I think Michael, you may have some questions, but the first question that I've been asked to talk about, the one that we got an email from was about conservation authorities and the proposed changes to the Conservation Authorities Act. So I'd just like to address that now. Um, the, uh, it, it's true, so the, the, the changes went through yesterday to the Conservation Authorities Act. And um, we have been in touch with our partners at the conservation authorities. This is a very serious thing. And back in January, when these were changes were proposed, the Bruce Trail did comment officially um, on them through a survey, a government survey. And we obviously advocated on their behalf. The thing that, um, the difficult thing with the Bruce Trail is that it crosses a great deal of different types of land. And we go through a lot of provincial lands. So, Typically, we've always been neutral when it comes to um, situations involved politics because we're invited guests on, on public land. So what we do and what we commit to uh, is, is working with conservation authorities, working with the provincial government in order to uh, push conservation in Ontario and ensure that conservation authorities um, get the, the resources that they need. So we're very, very much in support of conservation authorities, but we, we have to remain politically neutral. So I'm gonna pass it back over to you, Michael, if there's any other questions that uh, have come up during the course of the uh, presentation. Okay, great. And uh, thanks Adam, Brian and Mara for, uh, for, for the great presentation so far. There, there definitely are some questions. And so uh, the first one is, what are the boot brush stations for? Yeah, I'll... Uh... I'll grab that one since I talked about it. <laughs> I guess I didn't do a good job of explaining what they're for. Um, so basically a boot brush is we put it at the entrances to the property. So what it is is, is when you enter the property, um, there's like a boot brush. So you, you clean your, your shoes or your boots off. So any invasive species seeds that happen to be like in the mud of your boots get kind of brushed off and it falls into like a gravel area and then the seeds can't germinate and um, and then so you have you enjoy your hike when you leave the property once again you uh, put your boots in the boot brush and repeat the the same thing and so that's the we're hoping that it prevents kind of like the spread of, of invasive species and just kind of keeps the seeds um, either off the property or so they don't leave the property Okay, thanks, Brian. That's uh, that's really helpful. The next uh, question comes from Barb Mason, and it's how how do we receive details or dates about land stewardship training workshops? Yeah, I can I can handle that. So 
um, what you'd want to do is uh, contact uh, your, your local, actually you can contact the Bruce Trail directly. I'm going to say info at brucetrail.org. If you email info at brucetrail.org and request the uh, training dates, then we'll get them to you. And um, you know, obviously because of COVID, we're not, we didn't have workshops this past year and we likely will not have physical workshops again this coming year, but um, hopefully we'll supplement that with some sort of presentations. Uh, but yeah, keep, get in touch with us and we'd be happy to, uh, to have you at some of these workshops. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I've got a great question here, and I know I was lucky enough to do this, but um, I'll, I'll ask the question from Karen Bergman. Are we able to accompany you on a survey or trail routing example, come with you on your work day? Yeah, I can, I can jump in there for that one. Um, we always love to have people join us. Um, a lot of times when we visit a property, we'll invite our land stewards out um, to join us. Um, the one thing is that you have to remember that we are working and um, on a regular work day, we generally just need to be focused on what we're doing. We don't just stay on the trail. Um, as Michael knows, he's experienced it. Uh, we go deep into the bush, we go into swamps, uh, <laughs> we're covered in bugs, um, sweating, and it's, you know, it's, it's not as easy as you think, although I love it. <laughs> Um, another thing we'd have to consider is, um, you know, we are working, so there is a safety aspect to it that we have to make sure that it would be safe. But one thing we could do is maybe we could offer up, um, you know, like, like a day with a BTC ecologist. I think that's a, a great idea that maybe we could start some type of a program like that so we can get people like yourself that are interested and uh, we can go out and walk the property and talk about plants and look at birds. Okay, great answer, Brian. And I think, yeah, that's absolutely a great idea. I've got a question here from Linda Finley. Have you considered video surveillance cameras on any properties to deter ATV use or vandalism? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, we have indeed, and we have actually implemented them. Um, <clears throat> the difficult difficulty that we have is they get stolen. So uh, we did uh, install a trail cam on one of our properties that was being affected by dirt bikes. Um, and the very first time that we got the pictures off of it, we, um, we realized that these dirt bikers had gotten off their bikes, looked at the camera and flipped at the bird. So they were aware of it. The next time we came back, the camera was gone. Um, so the, yeah, we, we, we've tried that. And um, I think the trick is uh, we have to find a more secure method of, of sticking the, the camera onto whatever it is we're placing it. And then the other, the other side to that is that um, a camera is only good if the vehicle has a license plate or some sort of identifier. So we, we not every single ATV is going to be um, equipped with that kind of thing. So they, they, they work sometimes, but uh, I, I think we just put up a couple cameras on one of our new properties in the Dufferin section. So I will keep you posted uh, about that. Okay, thanks, Adam. And um, I got a, a question here again in, in regards to Bill 229. And I think we'll, we'll try uh, and get a little bit more specific, Adam, if possible. But I'm wondering, the question is, you know, how will the changes in Bill 229 specifically affect the BTC? And, and I think to start off, I can say we, we don't yet exactly know because they haven't been implemented yet. But Adam, I know you've been had a lot of conversations with uh, conservation authorities, so maybe you can tackle that. Yeah. So from my understanding is that the, the biggest change that's going to happen to these conservation authorities is that they don't necessarily have guaranteed funding for some of their programs that don't uh, don't follow their core mandate. So there's certain programs that we actually work with conservation authorities, uh, we partner with them on, like, like invasive species removal, tree plantings, uh, monitoring, uh, the Credit Valley Conservation Authority, they do wetland monitoring on some of our properties. So all of those programs are, are jeopardized now. They may not necessarily get the funding to continue. And that's gonna hurt the conservation work that we do because conservation authorities are very, very valuable partners. And um, they're really, they, they, they're organizations that we look up to as uh, nonprofits. We look up to for um, good models of uh, conservation work. So it's, it's really going to inf impact 
the greater conservation community in, in Ontario. Okay, th thanks, Adam. And then um, the next question comes from Jill, and it's it's not really a question. I think it's more of a statement. But the location of Fisher's Pond is it not in Burlington? Not, and I think you mentioned maybe it might have been in Waterdown. So can you give more specifics on where Fisher's Pond is? You're right. I was wrong. It is in uh, it is in Burlington. It's just east of uh, well, Brant Street turns into Cedar Springs Road at Highway Five at Dundas. So uh, it's just northeast of uh, Cedar Springs Road and Highway 5. If you follow the Bruce Trail through there, you, um, you can't miss it. It goes right through the Fisher's Pond property in Burlington. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And then the last question um, that we have so far is, how many of your land stewards are also trail captains? That is a very good question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'd say maybe 25 to 30% of them would be trail captains. But uh, the, the people that are, are very valuable resources for us because they do all the trail maintenance on a property, uh, also look at the property boundaries. So these are the, the folks that really, really know their property intimately. Um, and we love it. Okay, great. So. Um, those are the end of the questions, and so uh, I'm going to thank uh, Adam, Brian, and Mara for a wonderful presentation. Again, our conservation work is so important, and a lot of people think of us as a trail organization, so I'm so glad that you joined us to learn about um, some of the other work that we're doing. And uh, Adam, Brian, and Mara, thanks for all your great conser conservation work out there. So have a, great, um, have a great day, everybody, and thanks for joining us today.